Warning, this program will discuss adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. There's so much I'd like to say about Father Joe, about his history and experience, which is also very fascinating. However, I'm gonna keep it short this afternoon in line with the subject of his talk, which is all about simplicity. But if I could write a book about Father, everything in it would be complimentary. He consistently inspires us with his patience and his humility, with his faithfulness to the church, with his strong commitment to courage and encourage, and with his refreshing sense of humor. It's a great honor for me to introduce our Columbus Courage Priest of almost 10 years, Reverend Joseph Klee. Thank you, Chuck. I was wondering who the heck you're talking about. <laughs> but your check will be in the mail as soon as I get home. Well, if we could begin with a prayer, a prayer that's very popular with the Missionaries of Charity and with uh, Blessed Mother Teresa. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided, inspired by this confidence. We fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do we come, before thee stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions. Amen. Let us sing your answer. Amen. Blessed Mother Teresa, pray for us. Father John Harvey, pray for us. Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Well, Your Excellency, if you're here, my brother priests and reverend deacons and brothers and sisters in consecrated life and my brothers and sisters in Christ. Those of us who are a little older can recall the radicalism which characterized the tumultuous decade of the last century, namely the 1960s. A segment of society in this country became quite prominent during that period, uh, which consisted largely of college students who wanted to rather overtly express their disagreement with the direction that this nation found itself in. And the dissatisfaction had a few supporting causes, but an overall concern was the great emphasis that U.S. society put on the material, the physical trappings of everyday life, which this class of youth saw as excessive. So as a group, they decided to express the rejection of what they saw as a gross materialistic pursuit by adopting a greatly simplified lifestyle. Some of them even formed communities which came to be known as communes. And clothing chosen was only one manner of expressing their spurning of what they saw as a culture of excess, namely the blue jeans. And this became a hallmark article of raiment for them, both men and women alike. Well, meanwhile, on the other side of the world, working with the Passion also in the context of a simple life already for a couple of decades and working with people whose lives were characterized by simplicity by default was the woman who needs no introduction, uh, none other than now Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And she too had felt at odds with a more comfortable lifestyle as a religious sister with the Sisters of Loretto teaching geography from the vantage point of a squeaky clean classroom in St. Mary's High School to upper caste Indian girls. She would see the squalor of the poor of Calcutta, by the way, a city which has since been renamed Kolkata, given a recent resurgence in Indian nationalism in recent years. 
So she would see the poor of Calcutta out of the window of her classroom until the attraction to those people pulled her out of the school and onto the actual streets of Calcutta. Well, Sister Teresa knew that to be able to enter into the lives of those most impoverished, she would have to eliminate elements uncommon to the lives of the poor. So therefore, even though she had been with this established religious order, the Sisters of Loretto, and thus having already professed the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience, she knew that her new call would have to involve what she would come to call radical poverty, a life of great simplicity, a life with its needs stripped to the bone. And so yes, like the radically unassuming existence of the flower children or the hippies of the bloated first world of the 1960s, Sister Teresa, in her new vocation, would have to uh, involve a change to her manner of dress. And again, since she wanted no barriers between herself and these people that she was growing daily to love more and more ever more deeply, she put aside her European sensibilities in terms of dress, or even of religious habit, and decided that she would adopt the simple, most basic garb of the lowest caste of Indian women, namely a sari, spelled S-A-R-I, a sari of very plain cloth. In our present day, the religious sisters of what would become sister, and thus later Mother Teresa's religious order, namely the Missionaries of Charity, uh, they have become instantly recognizable throughout the world by this which has become the religious habit, the white garb with drew blue trim along the edges of the cloth. But again, even though distinctive and standing out today, most especially in the Western world, this sorry turned religious habit was chosen in the beginning for its total simplicity. And in the beginning, uh, Sister Teresa and the first young women, religious of her order, blended seamlessly into lower caste Indian society on the streets of Calcutta. Now, of course, this religious order, which evolved from such noble initiatives, namely the Missionaries of Charity, sisters, observed the requirements of the Catholic Church and her body of laws, which we know of as canon law, for a religious order, which includes members thereof taking vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And these three practices are collectively known, again, as the evangelical councils. And the word evangelical is an adjective and it means related to the Gospels and pertaining to the earthly life, of course, of our Lord Jesus. And so they are counsels or advice or direction as given to us by our Savior himself, who taught us by his perfect example of being poor, chaste, and obedient in carrying out his mission here on earth. But here we know that Mother Teresa, now blessed Mother Teresa, having been raised to the level of beatified, blessed, in October of 2003, Blessed Mother Teresa saw the need to put special emphasis on the first evangelical council, of course, namely poverty, given her realization of a divine call to work not just with the poor, but with the poorest of the poor. And hence again, if she and her sisters were to be able to adopt uh, the lifestyle and to enter effectively into the lives of such people, they would need to adopt what this founders, again, would refer to as radical poverty. Thus, the missionaries of charity became very serious, and you could even say passionate, about stripping their lives of anything but the bare essentials to thus follow a plan of life of total simplicity. However, in her holy wisdom, Blessed Mother Teresa knew that this way of life had very deep significance going beyond the mere immediate need to better identify with the poor. She knew that the albeit often necessary earthly cares of life could and do frequently drain one's resources of time and energy, and that such cares could and so easily multiply in a very insidious way, consuming ever more of one's time and energy. Now, I myself was blessed to be a seminarian for nearly a decade with her priestly order, the Missionaries of Charity Fathers. And we, too, were very much immersed in this beautiful ideology of simplicity as a way of life. And I can only tell you the wonderful, joyful sense of freedom that it gave us. Owning nothing ourselves, being that even our sandals and the socks on our feet and everything else were just essentially on loan to us, this lifestyle freed much of our lives for service to others. And so living life at a minimal level, material level, meant so many fewer burdens, weighing one down and making one less available to their fellow man. 
Well, as a boy, I remember seeing a cartoon once in the rather zany publication, namely Mad Magazine. Maybe some of you may be familiar with it, part of my childhood. Despite the emphasis on humor, there were not infrequent reflective messages about human nature and society in that magazine. And the one I'm thinking about this time was of that type. And the cartoon begins with showing a huge semi-trailer moving van and the father of a family who's just finished loading the entire contents of the family's house into this moving van. And he's standing next to the curb, wiping the sweat from his brow. He proudly proclaims that every last piece of furniture was covered with a protective padded blanket, and every article has been insured for the journey, and everything will be carefully stored away in a, in a climate-controlled warehouse uh, before being moved into their new home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then a frame of the cartoon goes by with the wearied father looking off into space, obviously lost in thought and stroking his chin. And then the last frame of the cartoon, he asks quietly, I wonder, do we possess our possessions or do they possess us? Well, some of you might be thinking that extolling the virtuous simplicity of Blessed Mother Teresa and order is all well and good, but uh, does this really have significance here in a Courage Conference? Well, granted, most everyone would come to this conference because they are effectively at odds to a greater or lesser extent with the active homosexual lifestyle. Many in a former time of their life may have been even completely immersed in a way of living uh, of this type. And so we would have to ask, what are some of the typical characteristics of this lifestyle? Well, speaking from my observations, my parish is quite close to an area known as the Short North a district located just north of the downtown of my city of Columbus, Ohio. And demographically speaking, in recent years, the short north has become uh, home to the larger concentration of those living the SSA lifestyle in central Ohio. And along the primary thoroughfare of this district can be found high-end restaurants and pristine art shops and establishments hawking decadent delights of a confectionery or culinary nature and the like. In short, businesses uh, purveying sensate pleasures where apparently money is no object. As a realistic aside, I might add that given the nation's economic deterioration in recent years, there is presently the occasional unsightly vacant shop and maybe the glitzy nature of this area has become a tad muted compared to even a few years ago, but still an overt consumerist and sense saturating atmosphere still does permeate this part of town. Well, as with any successful business, such as the short north of my town, the owner of such a business needs to, if you will, keep his ear to the ground. And such an astute entrepreneur knows that a fully practicing uh, homosexual and the like would have quite a few spare coins jangling around in their pockets. And those fully living the SSA lifestyle frequently do and lavishly spend those coins. So on about any given Friday or Saturday evening, Many uh, exotic and pricey cars can be seen being valley parked at the city's finest restaurants and the sidewalks clogged by patrons looking like come-to-life mannequins that just stepped out of exclusive storefront windows of retail stores. And thus the whole scene is one of completely uninhibited excess and self-indulgence. And it's all part and parcel of the active homosexual lifestyle. Thus, those that would be blessed to begin questioning their participation in this lifestyle might begin doing so over a gnawing sense of second-guessing this intrinsic element of narcissism and self-pampering to the hilt. A slowly dawning realization of an infatuation with oneself, of every whim being gratified, of a constant obsession with self-appearance and gluttony of all the senses could very well be where a conversion process just might begin. Well, speaking of society in general, however, we can see that this increase in the softening and the sweetening and the padding and the smoothing, et cetera, et cetera, of all of life's former low crosses of this life is not a trend that's exclusively of those plunging headfirst into an SSA lifestyle, but is indeed a phenomenon that's evident really in all of the first world. There has been a super subtle but truly insidious creeping amelioration of every nook and cranny of especially middle-class American life in recent decades. Like the frog in the pot of increasingly hot water, we might not even realize the depths of hedonism that we sink into until we've essentially formed addictions to many such luxuries. Well, it's just one example. 
In my career before entering Mother Teresa's priestly order to pursue the priesthood, I was a product design engineer for Ford Motor Company, working in a division that was fully committed to pampering our customers. This division produced the air conditioning systems for our vehicles and was constantly researching new toys and gadgets to make the drivers and passengers of our cars even more comfortable and free of life's inconveniences caused by a hostile climate. I was struck by what was called the installation rate of this one-time luxury of air conditioning on even the company's simplest automotive product, which at that time was the Ford Escort model. When it was first introduced, it appealed to those on a tight budget, usually young people, students just getting out of college, uh, not having too many loose coins jangling in their pocket with which to buy a car. And so they would tend to uh, shun frills of any options not truly necessary for basic transportation, for something that would get them from point A to point B. Hence, air conditioning systems were to be initially found to be on only about 10% or less of those cars produced that model line. But within 10 years, the installation rate uh, of air conditioning had risen to nearly 75% of uh, those vehicles, of that product line, the Escort. And again, this being the simplest model offered by the company. So it got to the point where even the, the bare bones uh, point A to point B uh, vehicle was uh, three quarters of them were having this uh, really the most expensive option of air conditioning and so on. And I would say that today, many consider air conditioning to be almost a necessity and that has almost become standard equipment on most vehicles produced today. Well, this is just one example of how our society is moving more and more towards an existence that's cluttered with every imaginable accoutrement. I guess we can begin to imagine why the SSA lifestyle, appearing to garner new members daily, with its emphasis on the sensate, meets with less and less resistance by an equally Epicurean culture at large. Although even though Sister Teresa had begun her new calling as a religious sister in her work with the poor, as just that, working with the poor, as interested young women continued to come and join her holy mission, Mother Teresa found an additional and even deeper significance to her commitment to radical poverty. Forming a community of like-minded young women, she was now to become the founders of a totally new religious order, which of course was to become to be known as the Missionaries of Charity. So thus she became a formator or guide and counselor of young women's souls as they would prepare to take formal vows of the evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So living one's life in the context of poverty, chastity, and obedience requires renunciation, requires a firm conviction and ability to not be dominated by human nature's baser inclinations. Hence Mother Teresa's secondary job, we might say, in addition to her primary role of conveying Christ's love to the lowliest people of this earth, was to facilitate the conditioning of postulants and novices, these being the titles of young women that were uh, formerly aspiring to join this new religious order, to uh, condition them to be able to say no to unnecessary material things, so as especially to follow the vow of poverty faithfully. And of course, the same was true relative to the other two evangelical councils of chastity and obedience. Young nuns had to learn techniques, along with God's grace, of course, to resist lustful thoughts, to be chaste, and to shun rebellious tendencies, to be obedient. And Mother Teresa knew only too well that no runner would be able to run a marathon without conditioning, and hence she and her sisters needed to live similarly. By rejecting sense-gorging worldly materialistic tendencies as a way of life, they would be building up their spiritual muscles, if you will, so as to be able to reject temptation whenever it would assail them. This Founders and her holy sisters knew that their appetites for whatever basic necessity of life was potentially like that of a spoiled child. If they couldn't firmly and consistently say no, they knew that such appetites would grow to control them, which would seriously compromise their freedom to choose their service to their divine and mystical bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, as seminarians in the community of the Missionaries of Charity Fathers, the priestly branch, studying to, uh, for the priesthood, preparing for the priesthood, we followed the same charism or spiritual ideologies of Mother Teresa and the sisters. The sense of liberation, of living life on the edge with only what we really needed made for a real sense of lightness of being, of freedom in the truest sense. 
Well, I'm reminded of the story of the woman who was on a pilgrimage to Italy and saw all the important sites that typically you would see on a pilgrimage in that country. But then on the last day, the pilgrimage guide said that the group would be visiting a monastery. And as they were to depart for the airport for their trip home after that last stop, they were to take their luggage with them. So in the course of touring the monastery, they were shown a typical cell and the stark conditions therein. A simple, small bed, a table, a small table with one book on it, and a chair in the corner of the cell. Upon noting the utter barrenness of the tiny room, the woman turned to the monk standing there and gasped, is this all you have? The monk smiled and asked her, pointing to her suitcase, he said, is that all you have? Surprised, our pilgrim rejoined, well, yes, but I'm just passing through. The monk smiled again and said, well, so am I. <laughs> well, speaking of monks in the monastic life, we might expect to find much relative to asceticism and simplicity in that context. And one early star of this way of life was the famous father of the church, a fourth century bishop and doctor of the church, namely St. Basil the Great. And he himself founded several monasteries and wrote a rule, which is guidelines, formal set of guidelines for living the monastic life. Uh, and of course, such a rigorous way of life as that which this holy and learned man of God espoused is intended for those our Lord would call to such a vocation, but nevertheless, uh, St. Basil gave many inspiring counsels and insights that all wanting to flee vice and embrace virtue would do well to study and to consider themselves. Well, in An Ascetical Discourse and Exhortation, one treatise he wrote, he urges his brothers in the consecrated life to be vigilant relative to slipping into too comfortable a life. In one segment he writes, do not accumulate a heavy burden of sins for yourself by having too soft a bed or by the style of your garments or shoes or any other part of your dress by variety in food or a table too richly appointed for your stage of self-renunciation. All these things bring harmful results, not only if they already exist in your life, but even if they are objects of your desire. Indeed, unless you quickly recognize them as a diabolical snare and root them out of your heart, they will lead you to defection from the life in Christ. And as well, in a homily that he delivered entitled On Detachment from Worldly Goods, the saint begins by quoting from St. Paul's first letter to Timothy. He says, We bought nothing into this world, and certainly we can carry nothing out. But having food and wherewith to be covered, with these we are content. By continually reciting these words to his body, he will, render, he will render it tractable and nimble for its journey to heaven and will have a stronger helpmate in the tasks that lie ahead. But if he should permit it to become overbearing and to be surfeited with food of all sorts every day, it will, at length, like a wild beast, drag him forcibly to the earth along with itself, and there he will lie, groaning to no avail. And when he is brought before the Lord and asked for the fruits of the journey on earth which was granted him, he will make long lament, since he has none to present, and he will dwell in everlasting darkness, uttering loud reproaches against luxury and his deceits by which he was robbed of the time of his salvation. Then lastly, this wise doctor of the church has simple counsels for those who do find themselves quite immersed in worldly snares, giving one hope to retreat from such a worldly direction and back towards a life of virtue and grace. He further writes, let us then flee with all speed the possibility of committing voluntary suicide. And if anyone has fallen victim in the past to deception and has amassed riches for himself, fettering his mind to the protection of this wealth, or sated himself with other crimes, let him, while there is still time before he has gone down to final destruction, cast off the greater part of his burden before his ship goes under. Let him rid of this ill-gotten wares, as mariners do. When a billow surges foaming out of the sea, threatening to engulf the ship weighed down with cargo, the sailors drastically reduce the load with all speed, even though they may be carrying necessities on the ship. They throw the cargo indis indiscriminately into the sea in order to raise the ship above the waves and, if possible, save only their bodies and souls from the peril. So once more, St. Basil was a monk and a passionate one at that. Monastic life isn't for other than the chosen few, but as is the case with saints in general, Holy Mother Church raises certain figures to the level of sainthood. 
And I, as I would typically explain to children in the classroom, uh, that they function as spiritual heroes for the rest of us, saints in general. We may fall short of attaining their level of holiness, but we should not readily and surely not cynically reject their lofty ideals. Now, Blessed Mother Teresa was not a theologian herself, and so she did not leave behind any ponderous theological tomes. But, as much, but much has been documented of her oral statements, her instruction to her sisters, and voluminous counsels to the world in general. As well, she did not have impressive academic credentials, but this is not to say that uh, her spiritual counsels are thus superficial or readily dismissed. And let's remember that she took her name in religious life, namely Sister Teresa, from that of the Little Flower, or St. Therese of Lisieux. This latter saint died at the young age of 24, and so even if she had been given a, gen a genius level intellect, which she had not been given, probably wouldn't even have the time on earth to have earned much of a name for herself through intellectually profound writing. So she lived too short a life had she been an intellectual giant to have even written some kind of theological tome. However, let us not forget that the simple work that St. Therese of Lisieux did write, namely the story of a soul, helped result in that humble and obscure cloistered French nun ultimately being named a doctor of the church. Thus, who knows? The ultimate profundity of the simple reflections of Blessed Mother Teresa could someday lead to her being named a doctor of the church, like her patron saint. We will see. Well, as a trademark of her communication style, Mother Teresa frequently used anecdotes to illustrate the simple virtues that she wished to promote in the world. So often implicit in these stories was the power of God's love and his grace to move souls to themselves manifest love and concern for others usually through touching gestures of self-renunciation, acts involving choices of simplification of one's life. Once she glowingly related how she received a letter with, as she put it, a sizable donation from an Italian boy who just made his first Holy Communion. But before the great occasion, the child had expressed to his parents and his relatives his desire for a very simple and austere celebration, as tremendous an event as his receiving the Eucharist for the first time was to be. And he wanted uh, to uh, forego the celebration so as to rather shift the funds to most needy recipients, namely Mother Teresa in the poor of India. And a similar but even more awe-inspiring and astounding account was related by her. It was that of a Hindu newlywed couple who paid a visit to Mother. And they gave as well, as she put it, a large amount of money as a donation. And given the overall poverty pervading Calcutta, Mother asked where they had gotten so much money, almost seeming to fear some form of impropriety was involved. Well, the couple, again, not even Christian, said that they nevertheless had decided to forego all of the expensive trappings of their recent wedding, meaning the clothes and the reception and even a honeymoon, and thus through such a vastly simplified ceremony and ritual to instead supplement the generous work of the missionaries of charity with the poor through their humble but substantial gift. As powerful and inspiring as such words from the simple religious sister were, she knew really in the end that actions speak louder than words. So Mother Teresa was really more at home with spending time with the people of Calcutta, strolling amidst the orphans and the abandoned babies uh, in her orphanages, and distributing food to the needy, and so on, more so than speaking to crowds of admiring followers of she and her sister's mission. And it goes without saying that their lifestyle and calling wasn't that far removed from the follower of Lady Poverty, as he called it, namely St. Francis of Assisi. And we know that this saint of old, as well, was no big talker either. And an amazing account from his life, many uh, here probably have already heard this account, uh, truly underscores uh, this, this saying and this, this ideology about actions speaking louder than words. One day, St. Francis assigned one of his brothers in his growing community to accompany him for what would be a morning of evangelizing in the town. And the brother was only too eager to have been chosen for this and to share his faith with what he expected would be the lukewarm citizens that he imagined they'd encounter down in the town square. So he boned up on pertinent and convincing aspects of catechesis. He brushed up on uh, scriptural quotes and admonitions and was basically loaded for bear. Uh, when he and Father Francis set out for the town, clad in their characteristic brown Franciscan robes. 
and they, of course, always had the trademark of exuding joy with their every interaction. And so they arrived in town and proceeded down to the town square and walked around it, smiling and nodding at everyone they saw. But after a couple such laps around the square, Francis announced that it was time to head back to the monastery. The company monk's jaw dropped, crestfallen that he hadn't had even one proselytizing conversation with anyone. Father Francis, brother protested, I thought that you said we were going to evangelize today. My son, the saint patiently replied, that's exactly what we've just been doing. At another time, Francis effectively summed up what had transpired that morning when he exhorted his community, we must go out into the whole world and spread the gospel and, if necessary, use words. And so it was with Mother. She was a quiet woman of God, and as much as she loved to speak of her passion for loving service, she still lived in a very Spartan context, and she preferred to act it out, uh, this, this message of simplicity and uh, unburdening oneself of things of this world in order to serve the poor. And the world got the message big time. In the book Secret Fire, the late and former superior general of the priestly branch of Mother Teresa's order, a priest by the name of Father Joseph Langford, may he rest in peace, he describes the powerful and transforming effect that the example of the simple lives of Mother and her sisters had on volunteer visitors to Calcutta. So many would be young students who, in the course of summer travels through Asia and the Middle East, would be curiously drawn to Calcutta having heard about Mother Teresa and her work. And so numerous were such young visitors that the sisters had identified a, a network of modest uh, youth hostels and accompanying facilities identified close to Mother House, their main convent there in Calcutta, uh, places for such young visitors uh, to stay at. Father Joseph describes in his book the all-too-common phenomenon of transformation that would subsequently take place with such young visiting volunteers. And so he writes, after their initial struggles with the heat and the food and the difference of culture, these mostly first world youth would often find a new joy and sense of purpose stirring within, an experience often denied them by their affluent life abroad. As the days melted into weeks under Calcutta's merciless sun, it would slowly discover that while they were touching the poor of Calcutta, God himself was touching the less accessible, the less easily admitted poverty of their own souls. Change from within, they would return home with a new peace. So thus, although God's grace, as transmitted through the loving acts of Mother Teresa and her sisters, was primarily behind such positive changes that would take place, the utter stark simplicity underlying the whole scene, the work of Mother and her sisters in Calcutta in general, uh, made all of this a foundation upon which to convey the message to such impressionable youth. Well, as a wise and caring shepherd of souls, Bishop Robert Finn of the Diocese of Kansas City in the year 2007 issued a pastoral lever, letter entitled, Blessed are the Pure in Heart. And it touches on a scourge that's presently raging in all of our society, and which typically and especially part and parcel of the SSA lifestyle, namely pornography. And so in the letter, this bishop mentions the most pertinent cardinal virtue of temperance, a pattern of good behavior which, of course, would not be in the least bit foreign to Mother Teresa and the missionaries of charity. His Excellency, in seeing the urgent applicability of this virtue to our world today, he writes, temperance in the exercise of our sexual appetites necessary for succeeding against the lures of pornography can be strengthened when we exercise temperance in the use of food and drink. The more we learn to strengthen our will by occasionally denying ourselves licit enjoyments, the more we will be likely to succeed in the temperance which supports chastity. It is a kind of spiritual conditioning that strengthens us for other challenges that will come. So hence the good bishop enunciates that which Mother Teresa knew only too well and which she and her sisters practice as naturally as breathing, that a life of loving service, self-sacrifice, and self-surrender will implicitly earn the benefactor abundant graces which will be powerful spiritual armaments in fending off the wickedness and the snares of the devil. It has become the proverbial no-brainer to thus acknowledge the legendary sanctity of the joy-filled religious sisters which was cultivated by the saint of the gutters of Calcutta. 
But maybe to play the devil's advocate for a moment, to take a break from this subtle trashing of anything and everything that our modern world has to offer, it is most certainly true that having the latest, the nicest, the newest, the fastest, the most advanced, the smoothest, the prettiest, and so on of whatever the world has to offer can help streamline and in a certain way to simplify life, but maybe not in a positive and virtuous way in the end. Emptying one's life of the numerous little crosses and tedious trials can lay the groundwork for conditions warned against by the age-old saying that an idle mind is a devil's workshop. The famous orator, author, and recently declared venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen once spoke of a then new development by a company producing pet supplies. It seems that in the research and development department of the company, their engineers had developed what they thought was the ultimate flea collar for dogs. In his trial applications, this collar, uh, in, in working with this collar in the trials, uh, this marble completely and thoroughly killed every last flea and was effective for at least an entire year uh, on the dogs. And the marketing department was eager to put this new product on the market immediately, thinking that it would earn a handsome profit for the company. However, the wise developers said, let's hold off for a little while longer while they would study the behavior of the dogs outfitted with this super collar to look at the dog's behavior a little more closely. Well, as the days and the weeks passed by, the engineers noted a growing sense of anxiety and stir craziness with these animals, and the condition only seemed to worsen with time. Finally, in the end, the company scrapped the plans for what they thought would allow them to corner the dog flea collar market as the experimental dogs were essentially climbing the walls. So empty now was their life devoid of what for eons has been a significant part of a canine's existence, namely scratching, rubbing, and biting their fur and skin in a seemingly endless war with this bane of a dog's existence. So might it be the case that while innumerable modern day marbles have liberated us from so much exasperating drudgery, admittedly rather simplified, our lives, that at the same time such conveniences could be the cause of a fidgetiness, if you will, not unlike the canine's plight, which ends up providing excessive free time and subsequently facilitating much of the moral decay rampant in our world today. Could that possibly be the case? Thus pursuing the right kind of simplicity of life seems to be the key. And of course, no real study of our faith is really complete without consulting the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that expansive tome which so wonderfully unpacks so many aspects of our faith. Commenting along these lines, Article 2015 of the Catechism has this to say, the way of perfection passes by way of the cross. There is no holiness without renunciation and spiritual battle. Spiritual progress entails the asceticism and mortification gradually leads to living in the peace and joy of the Beatitudes. So in the end, maybe amidst all the youthful irascibility so overtly manifested with rocks sailing through the air over college quadrangles hurled by the blue jean clad students of those campuses of some decades ago and with tear gas canisters being lobbed back in the direction, that whole scene, maybe such youth were really on to something. Their spiritual counterpart, however, toiling away at the same time in freely chosen and similarly, similarly austere conditions, clad rather in the traditional Indian sari of the cheapest fabric, was free of anxiety and rather was filled with great joy. And so it goes without saying that her sense of lightness of being was due to largely her not being burdened with an excess of life's cares and things, but also to a concomitant freedom from sin and temptation. She truly held the simple key to holiness and happiness. And a big part of that simple key was simplicity itself. Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, pray for us. Thank you.
Thank you very much for your talk, Father. Um, I have a question about what is official Catholic teaching with economics? Mm. I, I mean, you look at the Gospel of Matthew, it says, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus says, Command the rich young man, if you wish to be perfect, sell all you have. Um, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. So it seems like a dollar for me, I should earn a dollar for you. You know, love your neighbor as Jesus has loved us, so we should lay down our lives in self sacrifice. So you have a very demanding call to perfection, but then when you talk about the evangelical councils, I thought I'd read that saints, um, that not all of us are called to heroic perfection, that, that you know, we're not all called to the evangelical councils. So, um, that a saint is somebody that has, has lived poverty or chastity or obedience in, in ex, you know, high measure. What, what is the average Catholic called to um, vis-a-vis money or poverty or wealth or right use of resources? Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good question. Probably talk the rest of the day in response. Um, wow, several things come to mind. Uh, I would say maybe one thing comes to mind. Uh, Pope John Paul II spoke of the law of gradualness. Uh, actually, it's more of maybe easing someone away from, from vice and all. Um, but uh, like so many things, you know, baby steps. Uh, maybe if someone does kind of find themselves feeling like, gee, maybe uh, I am not living gospel poverty. Uh, so, so, much, so much of it would have to do with one state in life. Um, but maybe little by little one would wean themselves off. Um, there have been uh, treatments by our Holy Fathers in recent decades. Um, Pope John Paul II and uh, Centesimus Anus spoke of uh, economic matters and Pope Benedict XVI as well. Um, and though another factor comes to mind, our Lord Jesus, of course, uh, confounded the Pharisees when they asked about paying the temple tax. And he basically spoke of a balance, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God. So I guess it's really a matter of discernment, something to take to prayer, uh, because everyone's condition is uh, different. And uh, I must say, in my 11 years as a priest, I've mentioned this now and again, I see in my life and I see... Uh, in others, maybe in sacrament reconciliation. So very, very many manifestations of the sin of pride. It seems every other day I find some new way. Oh, there's another way pride can creep into one's life. And sometimes maybe we can go a little overboard. You know, we have agenda. We want to be a saint by the end of the month. So we got all laid out, you know. And uh, we're going to fast, we're going to fast, we're going to fast. And so meanwhile, we're strangling everyone around us, you know, and our blood sugar drops. And in the end, we have to ask, you know, am I really on my way to sainthood or maybe on the way to lose my soul? So we have to discern. There can be pride there, you know. I, I want to be a saint. I want people to look at me, you know, the, the wonderful of faster or giving away everything. And, you know, in the context of family, sometimes I've seen, like, fathers, you know, God bless them, good men that really want to draw closer to our, our Lord, but maybe doing things going overboard, and maybe they're failing to provide for the needs of their family, you know. Maybe they're trying to jerk the family along with them rather than kind of gradually pull them in the direction they feel God would be calling them as a you know, steward, the father of the family. So it, we have to take it to prayer. We really have to make an intent and say, Lord, show me the way. Show me the little ways, maybe little by little, you know, baby steps by which I would simplify my life. And maybe, yeah, I'll never come within light years of Blessed Mother Teresa, but she was called to uh, the evangelical councils of consecrated life, and I'm called to be, say, uh, you know, uh, someone in, in the first world. Not to cause a rush on the bookstore, but I noticed that book by Father Thomas Dubay, uh, Happier You Poor, mm-hmm. which is a, a beautiful, uh, very thoughtful um, reflection on the, on the Evangelical Council of Poverty, mm-hmm. which he applies for um, people in the world as well. And then if you've ever, uh, for the question, if you've ever read um, St. Francis de Sales, The Introduction to the Devout Life, he has some, some beautiful wise counsels on how to apply the evangelical counsels for different states of life. And uh, among those are, are the virtue of poverty, the counsel of poverty as well. So those are some good, good ways to apply that, that teaching uh, in a particular state of life. For sure. Uh, maybe some of you, as a quick little side, uh, you're familiar with the uh, famous theologian, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn. He would talk about upon entering into the Catholic Church, or maybe shortly before then, he would be up all night working on a theological problem, consulting his sources and all, and as the sun was coming up, he would kind of put down his pen or shut off the computer and say, ah, there, I figured that out. And then a couple days later, you'd look in the, some father's and say, wait a minute, you know, St. Augustine figured this out 16 centuries ago. 
you know, and here I am thinking I'm the, you know, wonderful uh, theologian in the 20th century figuring it out. So, there, yeah, there's so many riches in the church. St. Francis de Sales' introduction to the devout life, of course, is, is a classic. I encourage. Uh, Father John Harvey, of course, had very much uh, promoted it. So, yeah, there's a lot of literature out there, classic uh, uh, councils in the church from centuries before that, yeah, we can consult to try to understand how we should live poverty.